everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Deep Dive. I am back today with Andrew Rosner. He is the founder and CEO at Media Options, the number one domain brokerage firm in the world where you can buy and sell domains. And today we are talking all about digital scarcity, why that's so important and how that applies in the Web3 world. So welcome, Andrew. Thank you so much for joining me on another episode of Deep Dive. Yeah, thanks. Great to be back. Awesome. So why don't we start by talking about what is digital scarcity? Um, as you know, it maybe start with like what it is in the traditional world that we live in today and then what that's going to look like in the Web3 world. Yeah. So um, I guess since I was a little kid, uh, you know, I've had this inherent nature of being a collector. I, I collected rocks, I collected stamps, I collected coins, I collected, you know, a a anything that I thought had scarcity and 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 some degree of demand, I, I collected them. And um and I couldn't even tell you why. I'm not even sure that it was like the pursuit of riches. I think it was just this concept of hoarding things which are scarce. You know, if you know, I guess scarcity in and of itself is a zero sum game. That's, that's the point is that, you know, there's only so many. And so if you have it, it means somebody else doesn't. And so the concept of digital scarcity was, you know, is that it's quite a phenomenon. I think that it's actually highly underrated that, you know, one of the, let's say two or three biggest technological breakthroughs of, of Bitcoin when it emerged was to create absolute digital scarcity, the, which flies in the face of the original value proposition of the internet itself. The, the, the concept of, of the internet was to be able to take anything which is digital and reproduce it in infinitely, you know, abundantly uh, throughout the universe, the digital universe. And so, you know, that's both a feature and a flaw, right? If you have something like a copyrighted piece of content or, or, or you know, something that you've created, which is, is digital, well, you have a problem because it can be copied and spread infinitely. And, you know, the solution to that in the past has been, you know, really cumbersome, let's say, band-aids to the problem, which are things like watermarks, right? But, you know, digital watermark. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, snippets of code that prevent you from being able to copy a PDF or, you know, but these are, these are very rudimentary and, 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 you know, they're workarounds. They're not, they're not a solution. And so digital scarcity, absolute digital scarcity is an incredibly important and valuable concept, um, that allows for, you know, whether you're talking about something that's collectible, whether you're talking about something that is money, you know, uh, whether you're talking about something that has utility, um, it, it allows for a, 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 let's say a foundation, both for valuation and for, um, let's say evaluation, right? And not just in terms of price, but in terms of utility, you know, to understand what does the landscape look like? And so digital scarcity is extraordinarily important. And it's what drew me to domain names in the first place. You know, I, I understood that there's only one Pegasus.com. There's only one um, Zoom.com, right? And once you own it, if somebody else wants it, you know, we can debate and we can discuss what is it worth. And I have a methodology for valuing domain names, but that it will give you the objective value. And then there's still a subjective value, which is how much you're willing to pay, right? And, or how much am I willing to sell it for? But, but obviously more importantly is how much is a buyer willing to pay? So digital scarcity is what changes that pricing or value paradigm to, if I have it, it's worth what I'm willing to sell it for and what somebody's willing to pay for it versus, you know, if there is no absolute digital scarcity, then it's really only a matter of convenience, right? Because what is the replacement cost? So that's, I guess, the way that I, you know, see digital scarcity and, and the way that it applies to domains is, is, you know, if you own it, that's it. There is only one. Each one is a snowflake, right? Once you own it, if somebody else wants it or needs it. Uh, it's really up to what are you willing to sell it for? What are they willing to pay? Yeah, for sure. And so you mentioned like when, you know, you obviously have a lot of experience with valuing domains and you mentioned some objective factors and some subjective factors that you take into consideration. I'd love to hear what some of those factors are. 
Yeah. So in terms of the objective valuation, you know, we have what has been deemed, I didn't call it this, but what's been deemed the Rosner equation. And basically what we're trying to evaluate is use in commerce and use in culture. And so we're looking at the, the, the SLD, which is the stuff to the left of the dot, right? So if it's amazon.com, the SLD is Amazon. It's the keyword, the acronym, the, 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 the you know, whatever. Um, whatever is to the left of the dot, that's the SLD. And we're trying to evaluate what is the use in commerce and use in culture of that SLD. And the way that we can do that is we can measure search. We can measure uh, hashtags. We can measure YouTube uh, uh, searches. We can measure trademark registrations. We can measure, you know, there's all these different measures of use through commerce and through culture, right? Arguably hashtags and uh, social media handles that contain that SLD are an indication of social use, social utility. And uh, LinkedIn profiles, Crunchbase profiles, exact match Google search, um, exact match YouTube search, um, you know, et cetera, Ex you know, expand that infinitely. But those are really the key, the key ones. And that gives you use in commerce, right? So we think that, you know, once you've, and, and there are many ways to sort of tweak that formula. And, and I, 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 you know, I've evolved by thinking around this to the point where, depending on the domain name, it might lean more towards culture. It might lean more towards commerce. It might lean, you know, it might be an acronym. Uh, and, and so we weight these different factors a bit differently depending on the, 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 the sort of silo that the domain falls into. But the idea is that you're measuring use in commerce and measuring use in culture and then um, applying a weight to that and saying, okay, this is the total addressable market. And then the other really important factor is what does it cost for me to address that market, right? And that can be measured through uh, PPC. What, what does it cost to advertise for that keyword or acronym in Google or YouTube or whatever other platform? And, uh, it, you know, it's really driven by PPCs. There are some other variables, but it's, but it's primarily driven by PPCs, pay per click. What do you pay Google for somebody that clicks on that keyword for you to show up first? What does that cost you? So if you extrapolate like, okay, I want to own, um, you know, uh, I don't know, let's say um, car insurance, you know, one of the most valuable keywords in the world, uh, at least in the United States. If you, um, you know, I don't remember offhand what the numbers are. It's, you know, I've, I think it's roughly three to 500,000 exact match searches per month for the keyword car insurance, if I remember correctly. And so let's say it's 500,000 for round numbers, 500,000 people a month, just go to Google and type in car insurance, right? And on average, you know, let's say conversion rates are going to be, um, or let's say click through rate. If you are the first organic listing in Google for the keyword car insurance, you're going to get somewhere between, let's say 18 and 30% of the clicks. So if there's 500,000, let's call it 20% for round numbers. So if you have 500,000 people a month searching for car insurance and 20% of them are going to click on your link. If you are the first organic search listing in Google, you're going to get roughly a hundred thousand clicks per month. And in general, obviously every industry changes, but you know, let's say on average, you're going to have a 2% conversion rate. So if you say 2% conversion rate, you can have 2000 out of that hundred thousand, which are actually going to buy your product or service. And the cost, if I wanted to advertise with Google, not the organic first listing, but if I want to advertise with Google, and so I want to compete with that first organic listing through paid search, then it's going to cost me, you know, I don't know, the CPCs, you know, very widely, but let's just say the CPC cost per click to advertise with Google. Every time somebody clicks on your ad, let's say it's $200. 200 bucks every time somebody clicks, whether it's a five-year-old with no intention and just did it by accident, or whether it's somebody with a high intention searching to compare car insurance and plans that day to buy car insurance, you're going to pay 200 bucks. doesn't matter whether they convert or not. So your cost of addressing that market is going to be $200 times the 100,000 people per month that will click 
times, um, uh, yeah, that's it. So from the 500,000 that search, 100,000 are going to click, 2,000 are going to buy, right? And so you're going to have what's 100,000 times 200 bucks is uh, $200,000, right? So it's going to cost you about $200,000 a month to buy that traffic, that 100,000 visitors. And uh, from that 100,000, you'll get 2,000 people that will actually convert. And if you own carinsurance.com, uh, Microsoft studies show that your conversion rate will, I mean, obviously it varies depending on the industry and the keywords, et cetera, but um, from 25% to 100% increase in your conversion rates. And so if you can take from a 2% conversion rate to a 4% conversion rate, your cost of customer acquisition has actually been cut in half. And so if you can cut your cost of customer acquisition in half, then I, I would argue in my formula postulates that the value of this domain name is the ability to reduce your cost of customer acquisition over a standard business multiple period of time, right? And so you determine what that standard business multiple is for your business. But in general, and we do a lot of corporate acquisitions for clients, you know, people are going to pay somewhere between, let's say, um, you know, it could be three to 10 X, two to 10 X EBITDA. And so if you can reduce your cost of customer acquisition by half, that goes literally directly to your bottom line. And so if you extrapolate that out by, let's say conservatively three X, you know, that's your, the value of your domain name, roughly speaking, we've got something like 26 other variables that we include, such as the age of the domain, the length of the domain, you know, the ability to uh, replace the domain with something comparable, the, you know, there's, 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 there's a lot of variables, but, but really let's say 80% of your objective value is going to come down to use in commerce, use in culture, and your measure of that. And then your, what is the cost to address that market? Gotcha. Wow. Yeah. So that, that's, it's very formulaic and, um, it, you know, yes. if you want to go into that, you can for sure go really deep into that, uh, for, so that's great. If you, people... it, 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 I think of it, it's a pretty complex thing. I mean, if somebody really wants to, um, understand it further, um, I would encourage them to, uh, we own domain Sherpa.com, which is our industry domain podcast where we, you know, interview uh, people within the industry and we have just general discussions. There's a few different types of episodes, but if you go to domainsherpa.com and you, you search for Rosner equation, there's several videos that go really in depth explaining, you know, how this works. Super helpful to know, super helpful. Yeah, so this is all very advanced stuff. For somebody listening who's just a beginner to this, you know, they wanna have some real estate on the future of the web, but they're not quite ready to like really dive into the Rosner equation that deep just yet. What would be your best advice for them to, you know, to get started? Obviously blockchain domains are, there's only one of them out there. And so once it's gone, it's gone. And so for people who are really wanting to get, you know, whether it's like their name or their business or their kid's name or, um, or, you know, just like, uh, something out there that they want to sell even for instance, like I, I would think that a good way to start would just be to run a Google search, see what search terms are big out there and then try to snag those. Is, is that good advice or what other advice would you have for more of a beginner? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would look at it from two, two ways, right? So, you know, from a business standpoint, you know, I would look at it from a utility standpoint. So, so, you know, your name, your business name, your product names, your service names, you know, um, these are sort of low hanging fruit that I think, you know, it makes a lot of sense to, to defend those and to own those domains, uh, both for defense and, and for offense, you know, as you begin to understand this market more, maybe you want to start using these domains to receive payments, to stand up a parallel website, to, um, you know, offer something that is perhaps a unique offering specifically to the crypto market or, you know, to the web three market, right? To this, is, this is a very specific audience that appreciates a targeted marketing approach that is, Hey, we understand you might have different needs in the legacy system, or you might have different interests than the legacy route. And, um, we want to create a specific offering to you, then I think using one of these decentralized blockchain domains makes a lot of sense, right? From a speculative domain investor standpoint, you know, it's, it's really, it's quite simple. I mean, uh, you know, I think there's multiple layers to this, right? So if you're really just getting started, then I think use your intuition. Don't get cute is like my number one piece of advice I tell to any beginner. 
Don't try to get clever. You're not smarter than everybody else. Don't try to get cute, okay? And when I say that, what I mean is don't think that like because you misspelled this thing that, you know, oh, that's clever and that's going to have value. No, no. The only reason people misspell a brand is because they don't want to pay for the proper spelling, right? And so if you go out and you get a misspelling of, of uh, you know, of a word or a brand, sure, there's exceptions, but it's a one in a million that actually sell, right? You know, just think about it. Use your, your use your critical thinking. Um, you know, as rare as that is today, think about where there is consumer demand. Where is there going to be an intersection of commerce and consumer? And that's where you want to be, right? Where that's rental cars, hotels, travel, money. Crypto, you know, dogs, you know, it, whatever, right? Just like find the big keywords that represent commercial utility. If there's no commercial application, the domain has very little value and you're depending on somebody else with an ego who comes along and wants it more than you. If it has commercial utility, then you're relying on an entire market that there's going to be one, uh, let's say, pragmatic player, one pragmatic player in any given market who understands the value proposition and wants a leg up in competition against their competitors. And so that's the way that you need to evaluate this. And the tools to do that are search volume, cost per click. You know, these are the things that are going to tell you, well, how many people actually search for this a month? Well, okay. There's other things like, let's say we own directions.com. Now there are literally like 3 million people per month that just search for the word directions, okay? But that doesn't make directions.com super valuable because like the traffic is worth almost nothing, right? Because people could just go to Google Maps, Waze, all these completely free services that will give you perfectly good directions. And so what's the value of owning directions.com? relatively little unless you have you know you're going to use it in as a brand as opposed to its its obvious use case um and so you know you want to be cognizant of both of those things both search which shows you the size of the market and then cost per click which is going to show you let's say the value of the market the competition in the market and so um, you want both, right? One is great. Two is, you know, really great. So that's the way to do it. And you can use Google search. Um, uh, uh, sorry, Google. What is it called now? Google webmaster. It used to be Google webmaster tools. Now it's Google search console. You can use, um, you know, I use a refs, a H R E F S.com. You can use, you know, uh, Moz has a lot of tools moz.com. Um, you know, there's lots of different SEO tools out there that will help give you an idea of the total addressable market through search. Many of these things will allow you to check the search volume, not just on Google, but on Yahoo, MSN, YouTube, Twitter, you know, all of the social media, et cetera. So these are really, really valuable tools for finding what are the keywords that are popular. You know, interestingly, VeriSign, which is the registry that operates the .com and the .net, the .tv, uh, domain extensions, um, they publish every month a list of the most popular keywords that were registered in new domain registrations. And, you know, that's a treasure trove of information. One of the strategies that a lot of domain investors in the legacy route use is look at those keywords and then register, you know, let's say there's a hundred ultra popular prefixes and, a, you know, a hundred ultra popular suffixes. And I'm not necessarily suggesting anybody do this, but it, it, it's a strategy that has been very successful for very, for a lot of people in the legacy domain investment world, evaluate it, understand it. And again, you know, domain Sherpa, we've got a million, a million episodes, you know, that will help you understand how these tools work, how to use them. But if you, you know, use that strategy, take, Here's the 100 most important keywords last month. Here's the 100 most valuable prefixes or the most common prefixes. Here's the 100 most common suffixes. Run those two, you know, run those three against each other. Get a list of domains that are available and then go through them manually and say, okay, 
this could be interesting. This could be interesting. This could be interesting. Do a little more due diligence on search volume. Is there any demand for this? Are there advertisers for this? And if there are, if the answer is yes and yes, that's probably going to be a good domain, right? At some point. The other thing to keep in mind is, you know, in general, the domain market, even in the dot com space, is not highly liquid, right? And I have domains that I think are extremely valuable that I've owned 20 years. And so you need to have a long time horizon. I think that that can be said for everything Web3 or crypto. Short time horizon or high time preference, as they say, is, is not a characteristic that is well suited to investing in this market. Uh, a low time preference is going to get you a lot further, right? This is, we're still at the emerging phases of this thing. And you want to be staking a claim on your real estate speculatively or, or from a utility standpoint as early as you can, but understanding that, you know, a return on investment may, if any, will be likely with a longer time horizon. Um, and I think that's a good segue into, you know, if that's the case, then why now, right? And it's specifically for that reason, right? Is that, you know, sure, land in California is some of the most valuable land in the world today. But when people started, you know, when the 49ers started moving west to pursue the gold rush, literally people were just planting a flag and staking a claim on land, right? And that land had no value because I could say, oh, look at this piece of land, it's amazing. Boom, I'll plant my flag and take my hundred, you know, hectares. And then somebody else comes along in their horse and wagon right behind me. And they're like, oh, nice piece of land, Drew. And, you know, but they just go, you know, a couple miles further and they take the, you know, the next hundred hectares, right? And so until you reach that, that tipping point where there's no next hundred hectares, and then somebody comes along and they say, all right, well, you've got a nice hundred hectares. I want one hectare, right? And then you start a subdivisioning, right? And then once the subdivisioning is done, well, now, you know, everybody that's got a piece of land, value's going up because there's no more supply, right? And so um, there's different phases to this thing, but it's all driven by supply and demand, you know? And, and right now there's going to be more supply than demand. And later on, there's going to be a lot more demand than there is supply. And that's just, you know, that's the way that these curves work. And so you need to be buying when there's a lot of supply and no demand, and you need to be selling when there's a lot of demand and no supply, right? So, you know, that's, that's, that's how early speculation works. You know, when I was buying my first, you know, dot-com domains in the late nineties, I, I mean, I remember I was, I was still in college and I remember I, I, I had started investing in stocks. I don't know if I, told this story the last time I was on, I don't think so, but I started investing into um, stocks like pretty early in, in, in my life. And, and, and I'd done, you know, pretty well for my age. And, um, and, and I remember, um, you know, my parents are not particularly financially literate. And so, you know, I remember when I told my mom, I had sold all my stocks because I was going to start investing in domain names. You know, she was like, oh my God, you're crazy. And, you know, don't do that. And, you know, I had me speaking with my father's friend and, you know, he was like, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're off to a great start here and you're investing in stocks and that's great. And you should keep doing that. And, you know, I don't get distracted. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, it turned out the domain thing was a pretty good idea. Um, and so, you know, point being, there was no liquidity, like anything I was buying, it was either you were going to write it off as a zero or you were going to hold it long term because there was no liquidity. There was no market. There was no, you know, you were just buying these things and, and hoping that a market, you know, evolved. Um, and, you know, that was a, that took 20 years. So, uh, well, it took 20 years of evolution for the market to hit a point where we are today where there's, a, a you know, relatively you know, let's say a reasonable degree of liquidity for, 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 for valuable domain names, um, you know, dot com. So, yeah, I think that um, particularly as it pertains to anything which is relevant to you personally or a business you own or associated with, you know, your kids, your, 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 your interests, especially your interests, you know, I, I think it's very uh, uh, 
it makes a lot of sense. You know, why not? Right. Obviously, don't invest more money than you know you can afford to lose. Don't invest the money that's going to put food on the table for your kids. But I think it behooves you to experiment with this stuff. This is an emerging new technology. This is an emerging new internet. Right. This is literally a parallel internet. And so I don't know. To me, it's like, yeah. Why? Why wouldn't you stake your claim? Why wouldn't you, you know, go put the plant your flag on something you're interested in, on your name, on your business? You know, it just it doesn't make sense not to. I, I totally agree with you, Andrew, and thank you so much for putting all that in a, in a perspective. I think your story about you buying your first dot coms, you know, really puts it in a perspective. Because in the late '90s, like who who would have thought, you know, that um, that buying, selling your stocks, and putting that money into dot coms would land you where you are today in 2021. So I think that foresight is super important. I think the, the the mentality of, you know, being in it for the long haul is also really important. I think, you know, in this day and age, everybody sort of has like a little bit of ADD and wants fast results and wants to see things happen immediately. And I think we need to just put that on the wayside for, for a moment and think long term and think about, you know, how this can bring value for us long term. So awesome. Thank yeah. you so for much. For me, this stuff is important. Me. Yeah. It's, it's so important. Um, it's you know, so I think, I think, you know, for me, it, far more important than let's say the speculative value or the speculative gains, you know, in these names is 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 really the what they represent the the you know freedom, digital freedom. You know, nobody can take them down. Nobody can censor them. Um, and I, I just I think that that is an absolutely critical check on what is clearly a, a, you know a, a a a broken system that we have in the legacy internet you know not that there isn't still an opportunity for that to get fixed or or cleaned up but i think that this is an absolutely critical uh check on that power that has gone unchecked a hundred percent and then from a practical standpoint too we're only going to be moving towards a more and more digital world and so you know, future blockchain domains are arguably going to be even more important than the Web2 domains because that is the world that we're shifting towards is more and more digital. So uh, if you're early I think in the one of the things that I, I, I now. Yeah, yeah, I, I, absolutely. Um, I, I think, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about, you know, I got a lot of feedback, um, not, not necessarily all positive, but from uh, a lot of the legacy domain investors after we did our first podcast together, and, you know, a lot of it was very positive, but there was also a lot of, you know, legacy domain investors that are like, you know, this is crap, this is scam, blah, blah, blah. Classic, you know, everything I heard when I started investing in domains, right? everything, everything I heard when I started investing in Bitcoin, you know, in 2012, 13, whatever. And, you know, it's people fear what they don't understand. People fear what they don't know. And there is clearly a lot of uncertainty here. One of the things that I think clicked for me though in some of these conversations was that I think what a lot of legacy domain investors miss is that the role of a domain name in web three is not necessarily going to be the same role that a domain name plays in, you know, uh, the legacy web. Um, the legacy web is an address, right? It's an address of where to find something, um, typically information. And whether that information is a product or a service or whatever it might be, but it's a, it's, it's a destination to, to find something. More and more, I believe um, that, sure, that may be one of the roles of a domain name in Web3, but I think the more critical role, and I think, I think that is a role that they're going to play now, temporarily, that may perpetuate depending on the trajectory of the legacy route. But the utility of a blockchain domain name um, that I don't think is, let's say, transitory as a web presence may be, that, that, that utility of a web presence, the way that we use a domain name in, in the original web, that may or may not be transitory for, for these blockchain domains. But what will not be transitory is their use for identification, for a wallet, for payments, for parallel or mirroring, you know, immutable, uncensorable content, you know, as well as a host of other things. But I, but I think that that's one of the big hurdles that, that, that legacy domain investors in particular need to get over 
is thinking about blockchain domains and the, the same framework as they think about legacy domains. And I don't think that that's appropriate. I think that they're going to have potentially exponentially more utility. Um, whether that, that makes them more valuable is, is anybody's guess. And I'm not trying to say they will be more valuable or less valuable, more utility or less utility. What I'm saying is I think it'll be different. I think that they're going to have a very different utility than the legacy domains. And, and I think that's where a lot of people get lost is they think, well, this, you know, they don't do this. They don't do that. You know, it's been tried before. Well, this is different. And, and I think that's why, uh, they're, they're, it's different. And, and I, and I think that it's lost on a lot of legacy domain investors. A hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent digital identity, like your web three, your blockchain domain name is going to be represent your digital identity, which is so much bigger than, you know, just a digital address. It's your digital passport. It's your digital passport. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Yep. Well, any final thoughts, Andrew, before we wrap up here? No, no. I, um, only, only that I, I, you know, I can't wait to hear what the big announcement is it's coming that everybody, nobody will tell me what it is. So I can't wait to hear what that is. Um, it'll probably be out by the time this airs. Yep, um, it'll be out. But, it'll be uh, out. So everybody, everybody will know about it by the time this airs, and you'll you'll find out about it very soon. I can't wait for you and everybody else to find out about it. Um, well, thank you, Andrew, so much for joining me. Everybody, make sure you go check out Domain Sherpa if you want to learn more about the uh, Rosner equation and you know really how to value domain names and all that good stuff. If you want to do a deep dive, check out Domain Sherpa. Thanks again, Andrew, for joining me. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks a lot.